Hello, London. Welcome to the Manish Tiwari Show. We started last Saturday, and the world was different. Between then and now, something cataclysmic has happened. The world has changed forever again. London uh, is the multicultural capital of the world. Everything which happens in the world affects us, and nothing would have affected us so much as to what has happened in the United States. An election has gone by, and the results are yet not declared. Today, we have a very eminent personality with us in our studios. He is a known face on British television. He's very often seen on BBC. He writes for The Spectator magazine. He has been the longest serving correspondent, foreign correspondent for India, based out of United Kingdom. He's served Indian media for the 43 longest years. He's a well-known name. His books uh, have been bestsellers. His last one, which is called Late to Rest, his, his uh, kind of dissertation on Subhash Chandra Bose and the mystery surrounding his life and his death has been published to a very wide and critical acclaim. Let me invite and welcome Ashish Ray to our studios. Thank you very much, uh, Manish. Good afternoon to Good you. Afternoon. So, Ashish, uh, as I said, like today, uh, you know, we should have been looking or at least kind of been watching the American president swear, uh, you know, and take his off, uh, take White House, take uh, his new office. Uh, it might have happened on Thursday or Friday or Monday, but so far, there seems to be no clarity, or we are inching towards some level of clarity, but there are clouds of doubt still pending uh, la uh, large or his uh, candidature. Uh, between last week and now, we have seen a lot of uh, action. We've seen Trump claiming that uh, he has won the elections. We've seen counting being stopped once. And we seeing that it's resumed again, and Joe Biden is in the lead. As we talk right now, the counting is going on. And with some level of uh, estimation, we can assume that he might come back to power. Now, this is one of the most divisive elections in uh, the American history, at least uh, in the history as we know. In the last uh, 40, 50 years, there's nothing you know, none of the elections have been so bitterly fought. And uh, uh, you have uh, the president-elect, uh, the present president-elect, which is uh, Trump, and the to-be president-elect, which we are assuming might be Joe Biden, uh, from whatever information we have. This has huge implication for the whole world. What I would like to know from you, how you see what has happened in the, uh, in the United States, because this is kind of, uh, you know, in the land of the free, where we always assumed, uh, which we always assumed as the bastion of democracy, which the whole world looked towards for, uh, you know, democratic institutions, where observers were called from whenever there was uh, an election going on in a, in a different part of the world, especially in the third world, where there was always, a, you know, where from time to time there has been doubts whether the elections would be free and fair and uh, you would get observers from the United States. So this is like the holy, holy land of democracy, and you see something which has not happened ever before. Uh, there's the president-elect, the current president-elect, who's refusing to give up his office, and uh, there are lawsuits which are going to be filed. What do you see the situation as, and where do you think uh, things are going to go in the next couple of weeks? Over to you, Ashish. Well, first of all, I think uh, the incumbent uh, president, which is Donald Trump, uh, is, as of now, within his rights not to concede the election. Conceding an election is a political nicety. In this case, where there's still a little more counting to be done, I think he's within his rights not to concede yet. But what he has done is, I think, he has created confusion by challenging the validity and integrity of the election, which is completely baseless. And what we are going to witness over the next few days is a victory for Joe Biden 
and that is inevitable because he is in the lead in Pennsylvania and winning Pennsylvania alone will give him 20 electoral college votes, which will take him past the threshold of 270, which is what he needs to win a presidential election. So what has uh, happened and will happen, I would imagine, because it's Donald Trump, he has filed a lot of lawsuits in different states to question votes which have been cast uh, as uh, what we call postal ballots. Uh, it's called mail-in ballots in the United States. And then, of course, in this extraordinary situation of COVID, what was permitted is for people to do in-person voting for one month before actual election day. And so over and above, there was ballots which were cast on election day. So people are being extremely cautious. It's a matter of logistics and it's a matter of time. There's something else also which needs to be emphasized, which is this, that four years ago, the director of FBI, James Comey, told a Senate select committee that he believed that the 2016 elections were tampered with by Russian intelligence. In other words, what he say, said was that the Russian intelligence had hacked into voting machines in the United States, and therefore there was some question as to what had exactly happened. And therefore, this time, I think electoral officers have been extremely cautious in order to avoid a repeat of what happened in 2016. In fact, I spoke to Professor Philip Stark of uh, uh, University of California in B Berkeley, and he told me, and he's a, a very close observer of uh, elections, he told me that uh, not only did these irregularities happen uh, four years ago, but this time too, he suspects that among the states which uh, had some glitches, as they're called, and when you say glitches, there are serious problems, uh, in Georgia, for instance, and Georgia is still being counted, and it's very close. But having said that, I think in the end, it is better to be cautious and get the result right. And there's absolutely no basis to what uh, Donald Trump has been claiming. The election has been free and fair. There's no question about it. There could be the odd vote here and there, which uh, may have been uh, unlawfully cast, and therefore those votes will be rejected by virtue of the rigorous process of counting that is currently taking place. So sooner or later, there could be uh, court cases, but I do believe that sooner or later we will have Joe Biden, the former vice president under uh, Barack Obama, Obama as president of the United States of America. Thank you, Ashish. Now, one of the obvious questions which we all have is the implication of this election for South Asia. Uh, we know the situation, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, at some point of time, they all have been, or they all have been wanted to be close ally of the United States. Strategically for India, the last few years, uh, from the Modi government perspective, they have tried to forge a special relationship with Trump, with Trump administration. Uh, and there has been an obvious display of, uh, should I say, uh, kind of, uh, you know, affection, bonding, wherein uh, Modi has gone to uh, United States and done an event, uh, Howdy Modi. And similarly, Trump came to India and there was an event held in Gujarat of unprecedented scale, which has never been done uh, for uh, prime uh, for uh, President Trump uh, in India, and uh, the you know Trump uh, in Indian media has been known as Trump Sarkar, you know as the government of Trump, uh, a, a, as an allusion to the Indian way of calling the government. So there has been a lot of uh, should I say bonhomie attempt to kind of uh, between the two leaders to display a special bonding. Uh, sense of brotherhood. At the same time, we know that Pakistan uh, strategically been, has been a partner of the United States in its fight uh, in Afghanistan. Pakistan has been a key ally of the United States. 
to the extent that uh, at some stage Pakistan was known to be home uh, for uh, American military base and a lot of covert operations, a lot of uh, uh, operations aimed at uh, Afghanistan, but not just re uh, related to Afghanistan, also to the previous Soviet regime have been conducted from there. So now, uh, you know, the last few years, things have been different. Uh, and uh, Trump has not alienated himself from Pakistan, but Indian, Indians assumed that he would do so at some stage. And for Bangladesh, uh, there has been, there's been, uh, you know, the last few years have not been the most significant. Uh, I don't think Trump has paid, uh, played uh, any, uh, or has kind of uh, displayed any special uh, affection uh, towards Bangladesh. So what do you think is the strategic outcome of this uh, election and the fact that we might have a change in presidency uh, in the next few days or weeks, whatever it takes. What are the implications for South Asia? How does it affect uh, the strategy in South Asia? Uh, and uh, do you think there would be anything significant? There's something significant to talk about here? Well, obviously, uh, a change of government will mean implications for international rela relations as far as uh, the United States is concerned. You will find, uh, most importantly, a stable relationship uh, with the rest of the world as opposed to a very unpredictable relationship which has prevailed in the last uh, four years. So you will find uh, the restoration of good relations between the United States and Europe, for instance, between the United States and Japan, uh, for example. And of course, it would have uh, implications for South Asia. I, I do remember that the last time that a Secretary of State uh, visited Bangladesh was uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, and uh, quite rightly, as you have said, uh, uh, there has not been a great deal of traffic between the United States uh, and Bangladesh in the last four years. Uh, and um, the relationship as far as Pakistan and India uh, has changed. So you, as you rightly uh, pointed out, uh, the old ally, indeed a military ally, has been uh, Pakistan since the 1950s. Uh, so it was a very close uh, relationship between Pakistan and the United States. But Starting from 1991, when the, the famous uh, and landmark uh, Indian economic reforms took place, there's been a steady move uh, uh, towards India on the part of Washington. And uh, what we have witnessed in the last four years uh, is uh, a militarily a closer relationship. Now, this is a very controversial matter in India uh, for various reasons. And... Uh, people would say that uh, India has always kept out of military alliances. India simply does not do military alliances. But what has happened, uh, at the very least, is an alignment. And that, again, is something which is against uh, Indian history, because India started non-alignment and therefore wanted to always maintain an equidistance from superpowers. But uh, the Modi government has tilted uh, towards uh, the United States. And most recently, in fact, uh, just last week, uh, there was this uh, agreement on military cooperation. Now, this is going to be, as I said, uh, a matter that will be discussed by the new administration in India. I don't think uh, the new administration would like to disturb uh, this uh, agreement for the simple reason that Joe Biden has made it very clear in his manifesto that he would like to create a coalition of countries to contain China's aggressive designs. And so I think this cooperation will continue. But what India would like to resist, and certainly this is the bulk of opinion in India, is a military alliance. You can have a strategic uh, uh, tie-up, if you like. But and not a military alliance, and certainly not India fighting America's wars in Asia, such as, uh, for instance, in Afghanistan. The, the Trump administration was very keen that uh, India uh, send troops to Afghanistan to fight battles there. It's something that India should not do and hopefully will not do. Uh, 
so uh, if it is a matter of uh, uh, sending a diplomatic signal to China that uh, you know we are together, please do not uh, behave in a boisterous and belligerent manner, then I think that is acceptable. Uh, but beyond that is difficult. As far as Pakistan is concerned, I think the United States still needs Pakistan to find a solution in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, Pakistan uh, can play a role, a positive role, if it uh, so desires, in that direction. Uh, so I don't think uh, the relationship between uh, Washington and Pakistan can be brushed away so easily. I don't think the United States will do that. But they will balance it. And I think uh, the other aspect that you might find in a Biden presidency, one has to mention that although you might say that uh, the United States has moved closer to India militarily, but India has actually coughed up something like $23 billion in terms of buying armaments uh, and heavy military hardware from the United States. So in a way, Trump has been laughing all the way to the bank. Um, and also, Trump uh, cracked down on visas for Indians who needed to go there on intra company transfers. Um, and then on trade, India has suffered as far as the preferential treatment that it used to enjoy, but it doesn't any longer. So I think India will certainly be hoping that on the visa front and on the trade front, there will be an improvement in relations between India and uh, Washington. And uh, in the meanwhile, of course, uh, they will straighten out uh, the relationship as far as uh, military and strategic cooperation is concerned. Ashish, thank you so much. Uh, I think the points which you made are very valid. Uh, but still, I find it hard to believe that the ultra-right wing in India uh, has been gunning for a major victory for Trump. And I think the Indian media uh, has been full of predictions of Trump coming back to power, which is kind of, kind of strange. There have been all kinds of astrologers in India who have been looking at Trump's charts and predicting that Trump is going to come back. So there's a special love, it seems, of some elements. And when I say ultra-right wing, I mean uh, a certain kind of uh, uh, pop, a certain kind of, you know, political ideology, which seems to be very well aligned with the right wing uh, in the United States, which is kind of, bit, you know, it, if you look at it objectively, it doesn't kind of uh, gel together because both are very different ideologies. We have a call coming in. Can we take the call now? Hello. Yeah, hi. Yeah, my name is Sofiq. Whoever coming in the United States of America president, we don't uh, worry about anything. But I like to say, United Nations Council, the last four Queen. Sorry, it's not clear. Hi. Okay, it's gone. Okay. That's fine. So, uh, Ashish, what do you think? Is this, uh, was this alignment? Uh, something by design or it happened out of uh, some kind, some other kind of ambition? Was it kind of triggered by uh, the governments or was it something which uh, had its origin somewhere else? Because while all this was going on, Trump did not do anything for India. Uh, he did not allow more Indians to go to the United States. And he did not do anything decisive, even in the case of Pakistan. It didn't do anything decisive, which India can claim as victory in the true sense. So what exactly was going on here? Well, uh, from the Indian standpoint, uh, this military cooperation, this enhanced uh, military cooperation is clearly dictated by the fact that Chinese troops are sitting inside Indian territory in Ladakh. And, and so in a way, it's been a panic reaction on the part of uh, Narendra Modi. I don't think this was entirely necessary because uh, historically, certainly since uh, uh, the Indian uh, relationship with uh, China uh, improved significantly after the Peace and Tranquility Treaty that was signed between India and China when uh, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao was in power, um, since then it has been um, a decent relationship and uh, trade has galloped between the two countries. But 
of late, there's been tension. There was tension in Doklam near the Sikkim border. And now for months, there's been difficulty in Ladakh. And I think India is better off dealing directly with uh, China rather than ganging up with uh, the United States against China. China has not behaved well, it has to be said. Uh, but at the same time, I think Indian diplomats, and I talk about the professionals, the career diplomats, are capable of handling China if given the responsibility to do so. Fair enough. So, uh, in your view, uh, the last few years, uh, India aligning with the United States has not really amounting or not really amounted to anything significant? Yes? No, I wouldn't say that. What I would say is that, you know, it's a... Uh, to play America's game in Asia uh, should not be Indian foreign policy. There are undoubtedly gains from the closer relationship uh, with the United States. And uh, certainly this is reflected in terms of the trade turnover between the two countries. Uh, so that has to be admitted. But uh, if you're talking about uh, India benefiting as far as... Uh, the United States uh, putting pressure on China or Pakistan, it hasn't quite happened. Sure. I was listening to Lord Derek earlier uh, this morning on BBC, uh, and he had a very uh, useful observation to the whole situation. Uh, and uh, he was rather critical of the way uh, Joe Biden, if he comes to presidency, would be dealing with the United Kingdom government. And in, more specifically, uh, he was rather critical of the way uh, the new democratic government uh, in the United States would deal with Boris. And that rings alarm bells. Yesterday's newspaper, Peter Osborne, uh, yesterday's evening standard, Peter Osborne made a comment that uh, the end of the Trump empire, he used the word Trump empire, the end of the Trump empire would, would spell disaster for Boris. So I think th there are political pundits who have subscribed a lot of weight to the present situation. And if Joe Biden comes to power, uh, definitely they do see that the US-UK alignment, which has been historical, I mean, you always, US and UK, in terms of how the political uh, alignment has happened uh, uh, historically, they have always been together uh, in most of the uh, times in history, whether it be the Cold War era, whether the World War II, or, uh, you know, times in between when the world opinion has been divided, you see US and UK coming together. So this is going to be a historical uh, moment when you have uh, Boris in the United Kingdom and uh, if Joe Biden comes to power in the United States and they might not be aligned the same way. Uh, you know, Trump made in, uh, had made a comment about Boris uh, some time back that Boris is his mini-me. So, uh, the, you know, what do you think is going to happen now uh, in, in terms of uh, the two uh, leaders, you know, do you think there will be the usual chemistry? Do you think they will make the effort and uh, will have uh, the same kind of camaraderie which we have seen uh, in the past? Well, for a start, I've uh, observed this uh, relationship between the United States and uh, United Kingdom very closely for 40, 45 years. And uh, my view is that uh, fundamentally, it's a special relationship. It's a relationship cast in stone. So I don't think a change of government in either country is going to make a basic difference to the relationship. Obviously, Joe Biden has said certain things about uh, Boris. He has uh, described Boris Johnson as a clone of uh, Donald Trump, which is not uh, a great uh, compliment. And um, he and his team, and that includes uh, Nancy Pelosi, who is the Speaker of the House of uh, Representatives, have made it very clear that if there's any disturbance to the Good Friday Agreement, which governs uh, Northern Ireland, then the United Kingdom 
could forget a trade relationship uh, that is a free trade relationship with the United States. Now, I think what we have seen in the last few days and as we speak over this weekend, movement towards presumably a trade agreement between the UK and the European Union as uh, Britain comes out of the Union at uh, the end of this year. Now, that, I think, uh, is a sign that uh, if you move in that direction, then that will certainly please the United States, because the United States, and Joe Biden, by the way, uh, was very disappointed with the vote that took place in 2016, uh, wherein uh, uh, Britain voted to exit uh, the European Union. And that being the case, I think uh, he believes that uh, a close relationship with Europe and a close relationship the, with the United Kingdom is in the best interest of the West vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. And uh, one of the things that has happened under Donald Trump is that uh, there's been a slight breakdown in cooperation as far as NATO is concerned. And the NATO is the military alliance of the West against uh, the Russians. So all this, I think, will be in play. I do believe that when Biden and Johnson meet, I think Biden will realize that uh, Johnson is a bright enough person and that he's not really a clone of Trump. And I'm sure the relationship will move forward. But as I said, uh, one of the cardinal rules of this uh, relationship has to be no tamperance with the Good Friday Agreement that governs Northern Ireland. Thank you. Uh, there's another question, which is basically, how do you deal with the ultra-nationalist or ultra-right-wing nationalists uh, in the current situation? And obviously, Trump being in his presidency uh, in the United States has given a lot of boost to such elements uh, in Europe in the United Kingdom and in other parts of the world, uh, like Brazil uh, is another example, and of course in other parts of the world. So it does not surprise us when we have uh, ultra-right-wing elements in certain parts of the world, but it does bother us a lot more when we have those elements right here in the West, uh, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, because they can cause havoc. You know, they can practically change some very cardinal, fundamental uh, basis or you know some of the some of the most benevolent things which have happened like uh, you know aligning against climate change for instance which was reversed by Trump and similarly in the United Kingdom we have uh, people like Nigel Farage who have gained uh, popularity uh, by uh, saying things which should not be said uh, and uh, by kind of dividing the society. And Nigel Farage was obviously um, someone who Trump liked very much. He was invited by Trump during his uh, election tour uh, while uh, you know, 2020 election, uh, elections were happening. Do you think uh, this would end or this would kind of give uh, in some way, take away rather, not give rather, take away uh, the global status these figures uh, have gained, like Nigel Farage has gained kind of a global stature. Do you think uh, Joe Biden moving into White House would possibly bring an end to all this? Well, first of all, I don't think uh, Nigel Farage is a figure beyond uh, Britain. And I think uh, his role as far as British politics uh, is concerned is now diminished because he has done what he had set out to do, which was to achieve Brexit. And he uh, certainly helped the process in terms of the right wing in this country consolidating, the nationalist uh, forces in this country consolidating to get uh, Britain over the line as far as uh, leaving the EU is concerned. Uh, today, he doesn't have uh, any impactful role to play. And I don't think he has much of a future in uh, British politics. Brexit has been achieved. At the end of this year, Britain will be out of the European Union with or without a trade deal. Uh, and uh, in future, I think uh, the rise of Joe Biden 
a Joe Biden presidency will mean, I think, uh, an enhancement of the role of the Labour Party in this country. Because uh, certainly the victory of Biden will be warmly welcomed uh, by Labour. And um, there's already an indication that in the opinion polls in Britain, both uh, Labour and uh, their new leader, Keir Starmer, have been gaining ground, uh, whereas uh, Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party, which is now in government, have been losing ground. So that is something I see happening over the next few years. Uh, there is, of course, no election scheduled in this country uh, till another four years. Um, but I do believe that uh, Labour is certainly on track unless Boris Johnson uh, gets his act together, which unfortunately he has failed to do in terms of both COVID and the economy. Thank you, Ashish. Now, Ashish, you have been a very keen observer of the events which have unfolded in the subcontinent. You know, you, you know quite uh, a first-hand experience of the many events uh, in the subcontinent, especially uh, you know, the political storms which have come and gone. Uh, one of the key things which I want to talk to you about is the relationship between India and Bangladesh. I believe you have known uh, Indra Gandhi in your uh, personal capacity. You'd, you've seen uh, how uh, the 1971 war uh, came to being. And uh, we all know uh, that Bangladesh was born out of that. Subsequently, things have not been as smooth as one would have wanted it to be. I mean, India and Bangladesh should have been strategic partners. Uh, we can't imagine Bangladesh, uh, in any sense, threatening India uh, in terms of military or economic, uh, as a military or economic power. So I don't think uh, you know, there's any level of uh, uh, threat or competition, if I can say. But still, uh, you know, a natural partnership which came into being post-1971 has not really flowered or bloomed. Uh, in fact, things have gone from bad to worse. Uh, and in the last few years, I don't think there has been any attempt uh, other than uh, making the right sound or making the right noise. I mean, there have been a few incidents uh, which you can uh, say that, yeah, the leaders have worked towards something. But in the true sense, I don't think the two countries are getting any closer. I would have assumed that uh, Bangladesh should have been another Nepal uh, for India, uh, in the same way that India has a lot of ease in terms of traveling to Nepal. Uh, we don't have any visa restrictions. Uh, Nepal, uh, in, man, uh, in many ways, is uh, indigenously aligned to the Indian uh, foreign policy. But or, uh, with Bangladesh, there seems to be a lot of friction from time to time. And uh, with the new CA uh, announcements with Amit Shah made earlier this year, uh, you know, I believe it has not been taken down very well in Bangladesh. Uh, and... Uh, something doesn't seem to be right. And this is not just about now. It's been the case for the last decade or so. Uh, it's not, this is not in particular uh, in relationship to the Modi government and the present Hasina government in Bangladesh, but there seems to be something simmering there. Uh, it doesn't seem to be getting on the, the smooth road which we should have got into. And uh, I keep coming back to 1971 uh, when India and Bangladesh kind of where, you know, that was like the birth of a nation, uh, a big brotherly relationship which uh, India had with Bangladesh. But uh, things have not gone well. And you've seen all the leaders who have come and gone uh, on the stage. What do you think, what is your uh, assessment of this present situation? And where do you think historically we went wrong? Well, I think um, India-Bangladesh uh, relations are not bad. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, a couple of years ago, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, they did a survey and they came out uh, with the view that uh, while India has lost friends uh, among its uh, neighbors, the relationship uh, 
with Bangladesh and Bhutan was still very good. And I, I do believe that that uh, survey was correct. And so it has been a close, friendly relationship between the two countries. And um, what has happened lately, as you have uh, rightly alluded to, there are these matters like the Citizenship uh, Amendment Act, uh, which has been promulgated by the present uh, Modi government, and uh, also the National Register for Citizens, which uh, is uh, still there on the anvil. Uh, and that naturally has uh, been directed at uh, countries like Bangladesh. And, and that, uh, quite rightly, too, has uh, brought about a bit of concern and disappointment uh, in, in Bangladesh. I think uh, the natural relationship between the two countries is when Congress are in government in India and the Awami League in Bangladesh. Uh, that said, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, there is obviously uh, a different government in India, and uh, there is a bit of a jarring relationship between the two. But I think the fundamentals are still uh, very sound. There's um, a very, very good trading relationship between the two countries. It's flourishing. It continues to flourish. Of course, uh, COVID has impacted uh, on uh, trade and economic matters. and uh, we will find that once this COVID crisis is over, it will be back to normal. Bangladesh, it has to be mentioned, has been a success story in terms of its economic growth. Before COVID struck, Bangladesh's economic uh, GDP growth was 8.1%. It was quite staggering. And even now, the forecasts uh, from the World Bank and the IMF are that even with this uh, COVID situation, Bangladesh uh, could end up uh, with a 4% uh, GDP growth, which would be a very, very successful uh, state of affairs. On the other hand, the Indian economy has collapsed uh, because in the terrible quarter of uh, April to June, uh, the Indian economy contracted by something like 24%. And so that uh, will naturally have an impact. But I believe that um, between friends, there should be a civil relationship. Now, just uh, a few days ago, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath, he accused uh, Bangladesh of sending in infiltrators into the country. Now, that is not what you say when you are talking about a friendly nation. And Bangladesh is a friendly country as far as uh, India is concerned. So I think the overall relationship will remain uh, sound. I don't think it's going to go downwards. What you can say, it, it has not uh, uh, gone upwards, and there has been a bit of strain. Bangladesh, I think, has been very diplomatic in uh, not really talking about it too much, although it has expressed concern uh, to the uh, Indian government. But over the years, if you look at it, uh, beginning with the close relationship between uh, Indira Gandhi and Sheikh uh, Mujibur Rahman, there has been progress. Uh, the Ganga Water Sharing Treaty took place. Uh, exchange of enclaves uh, in North Bengal also took place. And as I said, overall, when it comes to cooperation, it's been pretty good. Now, as far as Nepal is concerned, it has been a special relationship uh, for uh, a very, very long time, since uh, the early 1950s. And that special relationship has meant free movement between the peoples of the two countries. Now, one day, if there is a, a kind of European Union in the Indian subcontinent, perhaps that will happen. But for the time being, I think, uh, as I said, uh, trade uh, will continue to grow, and there could be greater cooperation in various fields. Um, and I do believe that uh, a close relationship between Bangladesh uh, and India is not only good for the region, but it's good for the world. Well, I do certainly hope that we do create our own union, uh, a SARC uh, union of some sorts. And I do hope it happens in our lifetime, where we can move freely between all these countries. Now, uh, Ashish, I also believe that you've uh, known Mujibur Rahman, as in you've seen him in close quarters. Uh, this is his 100th year. Uh, would you like to share something with us 
uh, how well did you know him or uh, you know what's your impression uh, or no, uh, I, I did not know Mujibur Rahman I haven't seen him from uh, close quarters of course I did know Indira Gandhi and uh, I did uh, cover her period as Prime Minister uh, in the second phase when she came back to power at the end of 1979 I also covered her visits to Britain when she came here, particularly one in uh, 78, uh, mm -hmm. uh, when she was out of power and visited as a leader of the Congress party. Uh, but uh, Mujibur Rahman, um, I saw from a distance, uh, and I must uh, uh, narrate to you uh, what exactly happened. After the birth of Bangladesh, uh, and uh, when Mujibur Rahman was released from a Pakistani prison and uh, was flown to London. He then uh, flew back uh, to Dhaka, having stopped uh, in Delhi en route. Uh, so this was January 1972. The liberation uh, of uh, East Pakistan and the birth of Bangladesh was December 1971. So January is when he was released and he uh, went back to Dhaka to a tumultuous uh, welcome. And uh, I still remember the, uh, the television pictures at that time. And then in February 1972, he visited Kolkata, which is uh, my home city. And uh, there, uh, there was this uh, gathering, a rally of at least one million people. And I was one of the one million uh, when I heard him address uh, that uh, massive rally in Kolkata. And uh, I remember uh, his famous words that um, which he said in Bengali that, you know, I have nothing to offer but friendship and love uh, to India. Uh, so uh, those were quite remarkable days. No, very nice to know that. My father, I mind you, my father met him mm -hmm. uh, after the liberation uh, of Bangladesh in Dhaka. The reason being that uh, my father was a doctor and uh, as a doctor, he and his fellow doctors uh, had set up uh, these uh, camps uh, to attend to injured uh, Bangladeshi Mukti Bahini yeah. uh, guerrillas. And uh, they uh, could have uh, incurred uh, injuries, you know, even, you know, uh, bullet injuries and so on from Pakistani forces. And uh, they would therefore then be brought across the border into West Bengal and be treated at these uh, camps. And my father had been running uh, these camps along the border. And so after the liberation of Bangladesh, my father and uh, one of my uncles, who was also a doctor, uh, went to Dhaka, visited uh, Mujibur Rahman. And there's uh, quite a famous photo in our house of the three of them together. So that reminds me that you were supposed to go to uh, the Dhaka Literary Festival this year. Uh, and uh, you're supposed to launch your book there, uh, the one on uh, Subhash and the Bose, uh, Late to Rest. Is that correct? Uh, well, I was supposed to go there this year. Mm -hmm. The Dhaka Literature Festival had invited me, I think, uh, last year or the year before uh, for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. But then I ultimately decided that I will go uh, this year, which unfortunately didn't happen. You know, and then this COVID situation took over. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm hoping that sometime next year I will go uh, either to the Dhaka uh, Literature Festival or to the uh, what is known as the Boy Mala, you know, the book fair in mm -hmm. Dhaka, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps both. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, hopefully my book will be launched in Bangladesh um, and I will get an opportunity to speak about the book. Uh, there seems to be a fair amount of interest uh, in the book in Bangladesh uh, on Shubhash Post, and, and therefore I'm really looking forward to the trip. I've been to uh, Dhaka many times, of course, in the past. Uh, I've also visited Chittagong and such areas, uh, and I do look forward uh, to going there again. Great, so I have a copy of your book. So we was, uh, you can see this, this is the book which Ashish very kindly gifted me. Uh, and uh, I've read it. Uh, of course, uh, it's not an easy read because uh, there are lots of details. Uh, and uh, he's delved uh, and he's kind of done his research. Uh, but uh, the, the fact remains that he's brought a controversy to an end uh, 
uh, and he has summed up uh, the life and death of uh, one of India's legendary, or Bengal's legendary uh, freedom fighter, Subhash Chandra Bose. Uh, and there should not be much doubt after reading this book uh, that what happened uh, is conclusive. And the conspiracy theory model, or rather, uh, I kind of call it the WhatsApp model of knowledge dissemination should come to an end, <laughs> because that's causing havoc. That's what brought I believe uh, the uh, last or the present or the present president elect into power in the United States uh, it had a role I mean the social media WhatsApp and Facebook uh, stories had a role uh, and uh, I think uh, it's time that we uh, get our education from the sources which are uh, better researched and uh, which are authentic so uh, we come to the End of the show, uh, Ashish. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I believe uh, you know Bangladesh owes a lot to you, or rather to your dad, because uh, he worked for uh, the Mukti Bahini. He helped them uh, uh, through the camp. So I wish you uh, a very good luck when you visit Dhaka, uh, hopefully in 2021, and uh, launch your book there. But it was a pleasure talking to you about. Uh, uh, the current elections, and um, if we can take the liberty, we can say that, uh, as you said, Joe Biden would come to power or looks very, very likely. Uh, and uh, in spite of uh, whatever legal claims, it looks uh, almost uh, certain because there have been no, uh, there has been no proof of the wrongdoings, or at least we have not seen it so far. So here's. Uh, to a new world and a new president in the United States. And uh, we look forward to what uh, the next week would bring to all of us. But till that time, keep watching. And I will be back again next Saturday and welcome you again to the Manish Tiwari Show. This is a show to bring the multicultural aspect, the multicultural facet of, the, of this great city. And I hope to be with you again here next Saturday. Till then, goodbye and have a great weekend.